jump into tonight's class. Um, and that is callbacks and higher order functions. Um, one of the most kind of like misunderstood kind of concepts in JavaScript of like what, what it actually means. What is, what is a higher order function? What is a callback, right? It's not as, it's, it's not, not as complex as you may think that it is. And we're going to see that by the end of this class tonight. But it enables powerful pro-level functions like map, filter, reduce. A lot of you have already probably used some of these kind of array methods, right? Map, reduce. If you don't know how to use reduce yet, I really recommend you diving into it after the class tonight so you can get a little bit better with it. It's one of my favorite power functions. But, well, I just spoiled it. That's these map, filter, and reduce. These are all higher order functions. Why are they higher order functions? We'll get there. We'll get there. We're going to start it. We're going to start at zero. We're going to get to 60 by the end of this class. But writing higher order functions using callbacks is going to make our code more declarative and readable. And, you know, this is really important. We always say, like, you know, uh, as I said, everything's collaboration. Right, we're never you're never working fully on your own as a software engineer anymore. Unless, I mean, unless you're just like churning out like you know small websites for small companies and stuff like that. If you're working for a company, there, it, it's very unlikely that you're going to be the only software engineer writing. And even if you are, somebody was probably a software engineer before you. Somebody will definitely come after you. And when I say that, it's really important when we write code as software engineers, we're not writing code for ourselves. We're writing code for whoever is going to come along after us and either complain about how bad the code is or hopefully say, man, this guy really knew what he was doing. This code is really easy to read because he took the time to write code that's very declarative and readable, right? So a callbacks and a higher point is in more than anything, the most important part about it is if you're thinking about coming to Codesmith, it is quite literally the backbone of the Codesmith technical interview. If you have a good grasp on the concepts that we're talking about here, then you are really set up for success for diving into the Codesmith technical interview. So let's get to the very, very beginning here, right? So we are gonna we're we're gonna spend a lot of time on this this very simple little code here. And we're gonna do that because we want to, I want you to to really understand all of the different kind of pieces of the puzzle that we're going to use here tonight, right? So in JavaScript, JavaScript is a single threaded language, which means that it's only ever doing one thing at a time. It literally reads our code just like we would read a book, right? You read a book in English, at least. You start at the top, you go left to right. You just go down, down the page, right? This is how we read. Well, this is how JavaScript is going to read our code as well, right? And so while it's reading that, you know, just like you might like use your finger to keep track of where you are on a page, JavaScript is going to have a thread of execution that's going to kind of like walk through. It's going to like basically just, it's, it's the thread. It's like how it kind of goes down through our code, right? But the most important, I think probably one of the most important pieces in, um, Computer science, coding in general, memory, right? We, the whole point of coding is we're, we're taking data and we're manipulating it in some way, shape, or form. We're either creating it, we're deleting it, we're modifying it, we're moving it around. But no matter what we're doing, we need some place to actually store that data. And that is what we're going to use our memory for, sometimes referred to as a variable environment. Uh, tonight, we're just going to use the word memory. We'll have different, different types of memory, as you'll see as we dive into this, but we're going to store things in memory. But more than anything, we use functions. And tonight, we can't really understand what a higher order function is if we don't understand what a function on its own, on its own is, right? So you got to understand what a function is before you can understand what a higher order function is, right? So functions allow us to just literally save a set of instructions. A, fun a function, all it is, is a set of instructions that tells a computer how to do something. And we write those instructions down and save them in this label that we're calling a function, right? So that 
we don't have to write it over again. It's just like, hey, we're gonna need this, we're gonna need this functionality, where the word function comes from, we're gonna need this functionality quite a few times. So let's just store it in one place so I don't have to write it down 17 times. I can just like reuse it. It allows us to, to not uh, break a principle called the dry principle, which later on, I'm gonna call somebody and be like, oh, what's, what's the principle that we're talking about here? And I'm gonna call on one of you and hopefully you remember the dry principle. What is the dry, what does dry stand for, Austin? Don't repeat yourself. My man, don't repeat yourself, right? Um, but that's what it's all about, right? We don't want to repeat ourselves. Nobody likes to repeat themselves. You ever, you, you ever had like your mom is yelling at you, don't make, I'm not gonna repeat myself, right? Nobody, nobody wants to say the same thing over and over again. When we're writing code, we, want, we don't wanna write the same code over and over again. That's why we use functions to kind of store blocks of instructions so that we can just be like, yep, just, run, just do that. I've already written it down, it's over there. Just do that again, right? So we're gonna see how that works. So this code over here on the left, or on the right, I guess, yes, yeah, the right, it's the left of my screen, but it is the right for you. I've copied down here. So Austin, you've been here before. How am I gonna set up my board here in order to, for us to kind of get started here? What are some of the things I need to put on my board here? Well. Probably gonna to want to put uh, some space for global memory up there. Oh yeah, I just said we gotta have that global memory, right? So we'll oh, yeah. just put that right over here. Okay, anything else? Uh, well, it depends on what we wanna do or how we wanna break this down. Cause I mean, we're gonna have to start looking at things like execution context and where things are being scoped. So if you want to go through it line by line, I wouldn't worry too much about execution context right now. Well, we're, we're, not going to work, we're not going to worry too much about a local execution context, but we do need the global execution context, which is where we're going to run all of our code, right? So we need this space. So for now, that global execution context, yep. and, and really for the, whole, for the whole rest of the night, is going to be the whole board. This whole board up here is our global execution context. So everything over here on the left is going to be where we're actually running our code, where all this kind of thing is happening. On the right is this little block that we're going to store anything in. This is our global memory, right? So. Luke, walk me through, let's, let's start with just like line one and using your best technical communication, walk me through what's happening here in this code. Okay, first we're gonna um, declare a variable in the glo global memory, num, and um, uh, initialize to three. Very well said. We're gonna declare a variable num which is really just a label, right? If you think about it, it's like, okay, we say variable. What is a variable? Like, explain a variable to somebody. Like, explain a variable to your mom. Tell your mom, like, what, what is a variable, right? Or your grandpa, right? Whoever that is that, that knows literally zero about how to even operate their phone, right? You're just like, you know, you ever feel like you're just kind of like trying to teach somebody how to use the most basic technology. Imagine how would you explain a variable to that person, right? It's literally just like a label. It's just kind of, we're just saying, we're just kind of like labeling some things, you know? Like if you, like if you go to your grandma's like cabinet, right? You open it up, right? Maybe she's got all these like jars of stuff that you're like, why do you jar everything? Why, why is everything in jars, right? But she's got little, little tape on side each little like jar, right? And it's a label of what's in that jar because she needs to know that, right? She opens it up. She's like, wow, there's a lot of shit in here. Oh, this is, candied peaches cool great right so in our global memory or in any memory that we use we're going to store variables and a variable is literally just a label well what we're kind of storing in there so he said it exactly right we're going to declare this variable num just a label for what we're storing on the right hand side of that equal sign which is our value here in this case is three so we're assigning this label 
a value of three. Uh, Luke, continue on. What happens next? Okay. Next, we're going to save the function definition multiply by two in our global memory. And we're just going to save that whole block. It's kind of like how I like to, to write down uh, functions, right? So we're going to save that whole block of information in our global memory. So basically, it's everything from here to here, right? So we use that keyword function. That's how we know it's a function, right? Make it real, real nice and easy for us. They're like, hey, if you want to declare a function, you just use that function keyword. Works great, right? So we, we declare another variable, just another label, function. We're storing all of these instructions, everything from here to here, and we're just putting it right inside of this box in memory. Just like, hey, here's the instructions. Later, you're going to need these. So just keep them safe somewhere. We put them in global memory, okay? So we've done that. What happens next, Luke? Um, next, we go down uh, to, the, to the line below the function definition where it says constant okay. output. Um, and we're going to declare, uh, yes, variable output set to the evaluated result of multiply by two with num as an argument. Very well said. Very well said. So right now, like, how do I, how do I know what that is? How do, how do I know what to store in this place right now, Luke? Uh, it's uninitialized. Yeah, right. Right now, it's just kind of like yeah. uninitialized, right? If you were yeah. to console log output right now, it would say undefined. And it's undefined because we haven't actually initialized it with a value yet. In order to initialize it with a value, we've got to run this function over here. So we stored this function multiply by two. How do I know I'm going to run this function now? As you can see here, anytime you see these little parentheses like this, after that name of a function, means we're invoking that function. We're just going to fire it off. That means we fired it up. And when we fire up a function, Austin, what do we need? The new execution context. We need a new execution context. Exactly. We got to have a place to run this functionality, right? We're, we're running all of our functionality in this global execution context. But now we're, we're going to run this one individual function. We need a place to run it on its own. So we're actually going to open up our own little execution context here. And this is a local execution context, we'll call it. Right? And inside of it, just like in our global execution context, we have a global memory. Here we're going to have our local memory, which is only useful inside this execution context, right? So I've got to actually run, the, I've got to open up this execution context, I've got to run this functionality in order to actually get a value over here for output. So Tyler, walk me through, as I step into this function, what, what am I gonna do? How is this gonna work? Uh, we're gonna push the function onto the call stack, so multiply by two. We'll get to the call. We're, we're going to come back to the call stack in just a minute. But yes, you're 100% right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to add that piece in in just a moment. Sure. So we're going to follow our thread of execution into our, um, our function. We're going to pair our arguments with our parameters. So input number is assigned uh, uh, the value of num, which is three. So input number is assigned three. Perfect. Okay. And then we're going to declare a constant variable result and assign it um, input number multiplied by two, which will be six. And so to get that, we're going to need to take our input number, which is three times two, six. Exactly. Okay. Perfect. And we're going to return result out to our uninitialized um, variable output. So we're going to turn result, which we've stored, which labeled in our memory as mm -hmm. six. Where are we returning it to, Tyler? Our global memory as, uh, as the assignment of output. Right over here, right? 
Mm -hmm. So we're going to put it right here. Great. We've done that. We finished. We executed out. We've, we finished this local execution. Let's go to the next line of code here. Uh, Keon. Hello. Hi there. Uh, What's the next line of code that we're going to, that we're going to go to here? I, I, I'm going to be quite honest. I mean, I understand this uh, snippet of code here, but I have, I have no idea what's going on in the board. I, I okay. kind of have a gist that like global memory is like a lexical environment, like variables is declared in the global sense, but I don't really quite know what do you mean by global execution context? Okay. So a global execution context is literally just where our code is being run. Right. When JavaScript, oh, okay. when Java, when you, you write this code, right. And then when you actually click that, like you click that run button, right. You, whatever, whatever execution you're in, you're like, all right, run this code. Right. It needs like some place to run that code. Right. So inside of the computer, it's like, okay, first thing I did was declare a variable num set its value equal to three. Second thing I did was declare a function multiply by two set its whole kind of like value as the, the whole function definition. Then we went to declare our constant output here, which we declared, which we had to actually run this function multiplied by two with a value of num passing in, in order to get that value. Once we have that value, we sent it over here to the global memory. And now we're on to the next line of code, which is what, Keon? I don't really see the next line. It says const new output equals multiply by two, 10. Yep, there you uh, now I see. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's just running, uh, it's, it's just uh, putting 10 as argument in the parameter input number for multiply by two. So uh, that will be just 20. Result, well, it'll assign, uh, not not assign because it's const, but it'll assign a new variable to the uh, result as as twenty, and then it'll return that, and it'll be twenty also. So, all of those things that you said are definitely right, but in order to see, it's like we're looking at the code, we're like, yeah, multiply by two with ten, like I I can do that in my head. Right? But the computer, we think we we always say like, oh, computers are really smart. Computers are actually really dumb because they can only do what we tell them to do, right? So they actually have to like, oh, okay, so what are you gonna do? And just like we did up here before in our previous example, we're gonna have to open up another execution context in order to run this code because we're, gonna, we're walking through all of the steps that the computer itself is gonna oh, take okay. as we walk through this, right? So Weifei, what do you think? What, what is the next thing we're gonna do? We, we, we've declared this variable new output or are we going to assign it a value? Uh, we'll assign it to undefined as there's as we haven't run the function yet. Okay. And uh, how do I how do I run that function? What do I need to do? So uh, when we invoke the function, we uh, put into the local execution context. Exactly. I need another local execution context down here, right? It's going to have its own local memory again. Keep, keep going, Weifei. Walk me through this. Yeah, uh, now we uh, we store the parameter uh, input number and set it to 10. And it equals 10. That's exactly right, uh, because that's what we can see right down here. And now we create a <coughs> constant result uh, and set it equal to uh, input number, which is 10 times 2, which is 20. 10 times two, which is 20, okay. And now we return the result, which uh, exits out of the local execution context. And we store that, that number back into the assignment of new output. Exactly, we store that value, we assign it to that label that we created, that variable new output. And that's it, we finished. We did all, of, we, we read through all the lines of code there. Right, so <clears throat> essentially like every time we need to, you know, store something, 
right? We store it over here on the right-hand side in our, in our memory. Right? Anytime we need to run some kind of functionality, we have to open up a local execution context inside of this big global execution context, right? But we don't ever reuse the same execution context. Like once, we've, once we return out of an execution context, we're done with it. We move on to the next line of code. Right? It's why I left both of these kind of up here. And this is where like the threat of execution comes in. And what Tyler brought up, our call stack. Right? So a call stack, we're going to start keeping track of in all of our other examples that we have tonight. A call stack, we'll write it right up over here. And if, by the way, if, if uh, like Keon was saying, like some of the example that I'm working on is cut off on the screen, please don't feel free, or I mean, no, please do feel free to just like shout out like, hey man, we can't see what you're writing. Because on my screen, I can see it. But if you can't see it on your screen, it doesn't really do a whole lot of good, right? So just let me know and I'll shrink things down or make things bigger or do whatever I need to do because uh, I want everybody to be able to uh, follow along. Um, I've found in the last couple of lectures that apparently my screen is taller. I, I, I would think that Zoom's got it figured out by now, but apparently not. So everybody's got a little bit different a size of a screen. Uh, so if you're not seeing everything, please definitely let me know and I will definitely make accommodations to make sure that you can. Um, so the call stack, as I said, JavaScript can only ever do one thing at a time, right? So when I was talking about this kind of like thread of execution, right? So when, when we have this thread of execution that we can only go through the code like line by line, we need some kind of like way of keeping track of like where we are, like where, where are we? What are we doing, right? So we always have the global execution on the bottom of our call stack because that's, that's where we're running all of our functionality. Everything that we do is happening in the global execution context. Eric, where is that background? That is super cool. I want to be hanging in that bar drinking a tiki cocktail like right now. Yeah, uh, I wish I was at this bar drinking tiki cocktails right now too. Is that a specific bar or is that just like the cool background that you found? Uh, it's Trader Sam's at uh, Disneyland. Okay, there you go. Who knew? Like, do you live in Florida or LA? Uh, LA, yeah. LA. All right. I got to get me out to uh, Trader Sam's. Uh, just looks like a place that I want to sip on a cocktail. Um, sorry. Um, I just noticed that and I was like, wow, that looks amazing. Um, so <clears throat> call stack. It's going to keep track. You can think of a call stack like a stack of books or a stack of plates or anything like that, right? Let's say, let's say you have a stack of plates in your kitchen you can really only ever access the one on the top, right? If you, if you try and pull one out of the middle, everything falls down, right? So a stack kind of operates in that like last in, first out kind of concept, right? You can put things on top of the stack. You can take things off the top of the stack. You can't really get to anything underneath until you take it out. So the call stack is going to help us keep track of what we're doing in JavaScript. And we're always going to know that whatever's on top of the call stack is right where we are. It's the threat of execute, it's the, what execution context we're in at any given moment as we move through our code. So as we start up here at the top, right? We're kind of going down. We start our threat of execution. We declare num, we declare multiply by two, we store that over in there. Then we get to output, right? We declare this variable output, we have to open up another execution context. So now we have to actually come into this new execution context. And when I do that, I'm gonna put that on top of my uh, stack. So this is multiply by two. We'll see how much I can, how small I can write. Is on here with num, which is three, right? So then I'm gonna have this thread of execution. I'm gonna go down here, get to the end. I return six back out to my global memory. Once I return out of an execution context, I'm done with it, right? Which means that I pop out of here back into the global execution context. And when I do that, I'm going to remove this 
from the call stack. I'm gonna take it off the call stack and I know that, I, that way I know that I can look at the call stack, I'm like, ah, cool, global. I'm back in global, good to know. So now I'm gonna come down here, right? Keep moving, ah, new output. I've gotta run a function again. Well, I'm gonna have to go inside of this execution in order to run that function, right? So I go into this execution context. When I do that, I've got to put it up over here on the left in my call stack. So again, multiply, I can't draw, two with an argument of 10. I'm gonna run this functionality. I know I'm inside of here because it's what's on top of my call stack, right? Come down here. As I exit, I return out 20 over to global memory. I pop this off the top and I exit back into the global execution. When I get here, keep going down, but that's the end of the code. So I'm done, right? So this kind of like flow, all these arrows, this is our thread of execution, right? And it's just kind of like following us as we go through the code, as we go in and out of other execution contexts, right? If I had another, if inside of this function, right, there was some other kind of like functionality that needed to happen and I needed to open up another execution context inside of it, right? Then I would come inside here, back out to here, and then back out, right? And this is kind of like how this is going to work. The thread of execution just follows our code all the way through. The call stack, is gonna allow us to keep track of where we are at any given time. So basically everything that we just talked about is just kind of set us up with the basics for how we're going to talk through all the other examples that we're gonna go through tonight that I promise I won't make quite as granular as this. We'll move a little bit faster, but we're gonna get a little more complex each time, right? So thumbs on just these kind of general constructs functions, execution context, thread of execution, call stack. All right, looking good, excellent. So let's move on. So all of these concepts like together allow us to jump into something called functional programming, right? Writing functions. Some essential features of functional programming, pure functions. What, what is a pure function, Carlos? What does that mean? What do I mean when I say pure function? Uh, a function that doesn't change any global variables or anything in, uh, in anywhere else in the program? Absolutely. It doesn't have any side effects, right? So a pure function, a couple of points. Pure function is going to give you, with given the same input, will give the same output every single time, right? Multiply by two, this function that we used before, every time I pass in three, it's gonna give me six, right? Every time I pass in 10, it's gonna give me 20, right? If I pass in a different number, it gives me a different answer, but with the same input, I will always get the same answer. And also, I'm not changing anything outside of this function. When I'm inside of that execution context, I'm not altering anything outside of that execution context. This is a pure function, right? So higher order functions, very valuable professional tool. As we said, filter, map, reduce, you've used them. Hopefully you have. If you haven't, get in there and use them. We're gonna play around with them tonight. You can see them in CSX. We actually recreate all of these things in CSX. Quite a lot of fun. But it makes our code more readable. And as I said, part of every, not almost every, it is literally part of every Codesmith technical interview. <clears throat> Ask Waifei, he can tell you, right? Andrew's getting ready. He's gonna find out soon, but he's gonna be a pro by the time he gets there next week. So why do we even have functions? Why? Who cares? Let's see why, right? Okay, uh, Andrew. Create a function, 10 squared, takes no input, returns 10 by 10. What, what's the syntax for this? You walk me through it, I'm gonna write it out here. 
All right, so first we will declare a function. Uh, we'll call it 10 squared. Why not, right? We don't really have to call it anything, but we'll call it 10 squared. But maybe with uh, words 10 and not number 10, because that won't run. Dig it. And then inside our function body, we will just return 10 times 10. Return 10 times 10. Seems pretty straightforward, pretty easy, right? Wow, it's so weird. Do, do any of you guys have that like that that shift on your computer where at a certain time of day it changes from like the blue tone to like a softer like red tone? That just happened while I was looking down here and I look back up and it's like everybody like has this like red filter on them. It just kind of freaked me out a little bit. Um, sorry. Um, so yes, Andrew is exactly right. Create this function, 10 squared. Takes no input. We don't have any input in here, right? No input. And it returns 10 times 10. Cool. All right. Um, Elisa. How would I write a function called nine squared? Uh, we would essentially do the same thing that Andrew did. Um, okay, walk me through it. Sure, um, we're gonna have a function declaration with the label uh, maybe nine squared with some camel casing. Okay. And there's no inputs, um, so no parameters. And then within the body of the function, we would just do nine times, we would return nine times nine. Return nine times nine. Well done, it works, right? Every single time, it's gonna return nine times nine. And Kyle, I also have my technical interview next week. Oh, all right, well, I'm gonna start picking on you then more too. Okay, who was the other person that has a technical interview coming up on Saturday? Is that you, Jonah? Who is that? That's Toby. Toby. All right, Toby. We're going to go out on a limb here. I want to create a function called 8 squared. How do I do that? Oof. We're going to declare a function. Okay. Call it 8 squared. Takes no parameters. And we will, in the block, we'll go inside the block and return 8 times 8. Am I in? You're in. <laughs> Does this feel a little bit repetitive? Does this seem kind of like annoying? Like what, I mean, A, why would you, why would you want to write all of these different functions, right? What, what, what principle are we breaking here, Toby Wan? Uh, we are work, um, breaking that, um, don't repeat yourself. Yes, which is called- dry, The dry principle. Dry principle, exactly. We're breaking the dry principle here. We're writing the same freaking code over and over and over again. How could I fix, how could I solve this problem and make it a little more efficient so that I don't have to write the same freaking code over and over and over again? Warren, what do you think? How can I do this? Well, you can write a function that takes a function definition and as one of its parameters. I could take a function that takes a function definition as its parameter. I, I, I could do that, but do I really need to do that here? I think you're, you're jumping, you're jumping sorry, ahead. Yeah, I am jumping ahead, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, Tyler, Tyler, Tyler's raising his hand, let's see. Uh, we could assign a, uh, the um, variable, uh, we can assign, sorry, we can assign a num as the parameter, and then we can just change the value of num in order to um, change the number that we want to multiply. So it could be num, and it'll be num times num, and equals that result. What should I call this function, Tyler? Uh, we'll just say square num. Square num. It takes in a parameter num. And what am I doing inside of there? Uh, it's going to be num multiplied by num, or it's going to return num multiplied by num.
Exactly. Function, square num. Takes in a num, returns num times num. I don't need to write 10 squared, 9 squared, 8 squared, right? What if I want like 171 squared, right? I just, I just need some kind of like function that allows me to use the same logic over and over and over again with a different input, right? So here, we generalize the function, right? We make it reusable so that we're not repeating ourselves, right? So we have parameters, basically just like placeholders, right? Mean we don't need to decide what data to run our functionality on until we run the function and provide an actual value, which is what we're gonna call an argument. So on this page, Warren, what is my parameter? In this, in this code over here, what is my parameter? Your parameter is num. Exactly. My parameter is num. Uh, Zyba, give me an argument. What do you see on this line in this code that is an argument? Sorry, I was on mute. No um, worries. Do you mean like give a number like nine or something? Yeah, nine is one of my arguments. Lynn, what's another argument? Oh, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Say that again. Can you hear now me? we can hear you. Yes. Oh, well, sorry. It's eight, nine, ten. Eight, nine, and ten. These are all arguments, right? So when we <clears throat> when we went into this function before, right? We were using an argument, right? We were saying input number was our parameter. And our argument was whatever we passed into that each time. So when the first thing that we do when we walk into an execution context is we pair up our parameter and our arguments, right? So in this first case, it was input number equals three because we passed in num here, which num was three. The second time we paired up num, uh, input number as 10, right? So a parameter is what we're using as that placeholder, right? And it's going to basically be set into our local memory the very first thing that we do when we enter into a function. When we go into that new local execution context, we're gonna pair up our parameter and our argument, right? So higher order functions follow the same principle. We may not want to decide exactly what some of our functionality is until we run our function. So, now suppose we have a function copy array and multiply by two, All right? So on this, on the side here, obviously, uh, well, not obviously, but hopefully you are always declaring your function names with something very declarative. So it's very clear what it is that they're going to do. So Ron, Austin, what do you think this function is going to do? Uh, well, it's going to take the arguments that you're passing into it and then do all the operations that are assigned to the function. And then exactly. return new. But I'm not going to, yeah. Okay. Specifically, just by the name of this function, in the most granular level that you can think of, what is this function going to do? <laughs> Don't overthink it. It's going to map out a new array and do an operation. Well, I'm going to say it's going to copy an array and multiply it by two. Exactly. That's what I was looking for. It is literally <laughs> going to copy an array and multiply by two. Yep. That's what we're going to do. We're going to walk through how we're going to kind of go through this, right? So just like everything else, let's diagram it out. 